Log on, tune in, find out. Another good idea from Cambridge. So our speaker today is um, Dr. William Carroll. He's the Thomas Aquinas Fellow in Theology and Science at Blackfriars School, Oxford. Um, he's a theologian. He's a historian of intellectual European history um, who's um, obviously done a lot of thinking and indeed a lot of writing uh, about our topic for today. Um, if I could just mention that um, his seminar today, um, if you missed it or you want to follow up on it, uh, will be published in a, in a sort of modified form in the journal which I happen to edit, Science and Christian Belief, uh, which is the next issue coming out in April. And so if you want to, uh, to read um, what, much of what uh, Dr. Carroll says to us today, it will be uh, coming out there. And his title is Creation and Contemporary Science, the Legacy of Thomas Aquinas. So thank you very much. Very, uh, thank you, Dennis. I'm very pleased uh, to be here at Cambridge uh, uh, to talk with you this, uh, this afternoon. One of the advantages of talking about creation and contemporary science is there's always something new to say because it's contemporary science. So although the fundamental features of what I'm going to say, especially about Thomas Aquinas, will be in the uh, article to be published, you will find some uh, uh, new new items here that have appeared since the material was submitted to the journal and, uh, and today. Uh, I have a handout, which I hope you all have. Uh, this you can take this with you, give you the sense perhaps that something important has happened. It's a sort of a handout instead of a PowerPoint uh, presentation, because as you know, uh, one word is worth a thousand pictures. <laughs> uh, on, the back, on the bottom of the second page, well, uh, hard to see the logo. Uh, on the bottom of the uh, second page is my email address uh, at Oxford. Uh, I remind you uh, or tell you that we have an elaborate uh, system at Oxford to prevent unpleasant emails coming to us. So <laughs> they will be they will be filtered. <laughs> also on the handout, uh, those. Uh, quotations in italics are my words. They're sort of part of the central themes that I'm going to discuss with you when I thought appropriate to put them on, put them on the text. So anything in italics is by me. In August of last year, the Discovery Channel in the United States began a series of television programs under the uh, general rubric of curiosity. The first program had the uh, provocative title, Did God Create the Universe? And the focus of that program was the thought of Stephen Hawking and his claim that the laws of nature will tell us whether we need God to explain the universe at all. And as many of you are familiar, his fundamental point is that there is no need for a creator since science offers a more compelling account of the origin of the universe than does any appeal to a creator. And in early January of this year, the American theoretical physicist Lawrence Krauss published a new book, A Universe from Nothing, Why There is Something Rather Than Nothing, offering a striking landscape of ever deeper senses of nothing Krauss concludes, and this is quotation one on your handout, we have discovered that all signs suggest a universe that could and plausibly did arise from a deeper nothing involving the absence of space itself and which one day may return to nothing by our processes, oh, there you see my North American accent, I wish I was, by our processes <laughs> that may not only be comprehensible but also processes that do not require any external control or direction. Krauss is aware, but I'm afraid only dimly aware, of philosophical and theological objections to any attempts to relate his sense or senses of nothing with the nothing central to the traditional doctrine of creation out of nothing. Nevertheless, he writes, and this is quotation two on your handout, some philosophers and many theologians define and redefine nothing 
as not being any of the versions of nothing that scientists currently describe. But therein, in my opinion, lies the intellectual bankruptcy of much of theology and some of modern philosophy. For surely nothing is every bit as physical as something, especially if it is to be defined as the absence of something. It then behooves us to understand precisely the physical nature of both these quantities. And without science, any definition is just words. I will have occasion to return to the claims of Hawking and Krauss later in my talk. For now, you'll have to be put up with just words. <laughs> Cosmology and evolutionary biology are often used to argue that contemporary science has eliminated the need to appeal to a creator, to explain the origin and developments of the universe and, and of life in the universe. Discussions about creation and evolution can easily become obscured in broader political, social, and philosophical contexts. Indeed, evolution and creation have taken on cultural connotations. They serve as ideological markers, with the result that each has come to stand for a competing worldview. For some, to embrace evolution is to affirm an exclusively secular and atheistic view of reality. And evolution is accordingly either welcomed or rejected on such grounds. Often today, the choice seems to be between a purely natural explanation of the origin and development of life, an explanation in terms of common descent, genetic mutations, and natural selection as the mechanism of biological change on the one hand, and on the other hand, an explanation which sees divine agency as the source of life in all its diversity, and that human beings, created in the image and likeness of God, have a special place in the universe. The difference appears stark, either Darwin or God. Now, what is at issue in these current debates is not some naive view that the earth is only 10,000 years old, or that God created it in six days. Rather, for many believers, however old the world is, God is necessary to explain the order and design evident in it. At times, this view has come to mean that God has directly intervened to create each of the different species of living things. It is precisely such an understanding of creation that many people think evolution denies. Not only does natural selection replace divine agency, but chance supplants order and design in explanations of the origin of life. Stuart Kaufman, famous for his work on information systems and biocomplexity, argues that we are reinventing the sacred as a result of a new view of science. This new view involves a rejection of reductionism and an affirmation of the emergent properties of a dynamic universe of ceaseless creativity. As Kaufman observes, and this is quotation number three on your handout, life has emerged in the universe without requiring special intervention from a creator god. All, I claim, arose without a creator god. Is not this view a view based on an expanded science, God enough? Is not nature itself creativity enough? What more do we really need of God? Thus, to accept the dynamism of nature as an explanation of the changes and diversity in and among living things appears to do away with the need for a creator. Such a view is also behind the fear which informs many believers who reject evolution in order to hold on to the need for a creator, once again, either Darwin or God. Now, I think this sense of a fundamental incompatibility between creation and evolution is part of a wider intellectual framework 
in which scientific developments have been used to support a kind of totalizing naturalism. This is the view that the universe and the processes within it need no explanation beyond the categories of the natural sciences. This is Stephen Hawking's point. The laws of nature explain all that needs to be explained, including the origin of the universe itself. <coughs> and it is this broad topic, namely that the natural sciences, in particular biology and cosmology, have shown us that we do not need a creator, which I wish to explore in this talk. The argument is that contemporary science is fully sufficient, at least in principle, to account for all that needs to be accounted for in the universe. <clears throat> Whether we speak of explanations of the Big Bang itself, such as quantum tunneling from nothing, or of some version of a multiverse hypothesis, or of self-organizing principles in biological change, including at times appeals to randomness and chance as ultimate explanations. The conclusion which seems inescapable to many is that there is no need to appeal to a creator, that is, to any cause which is outside the natural order. Here's how one cosmologist, uh, Lee Smolin, put it. And this is quotation number four on your handout. <clears throat> we humans are the species that make things. So when we find something that appears to be beautifully and intricately structured, our almost instinctive response is to ask, who made that? The most important lesson to be learned, if we are to prepare ourselves to approach the universe scientifically, is that this is not the right question to ask. It is true that the universe is as beautiful as it is intricately structured, but it cannot have been made by anything that exists outside of it. But by definition, the universe is all there is, and there can be nothing outside it. And by definition, neither can there have been anything before the universe that caused it. For if anything existed, it must have been part of the universe. So the first principle of cosmology must be, there is nothing outside the universe. The first principle means that we take the universe to be, by definition, a closed system. It means that the explanation for anything in the universe can involve only other things that also exist in the universe. <clears throat> but as we shall see, to speak of God as creator does not mean that God is either outside or before the universe, even though God is radically other than the universe of created things. Now I want to turn our attention to I want to turn our attention for a while to claims about creation and, cos and developments in cosmology. Many of those who are in opposing camps about the philosophical and theological implications of contemporary cosmology tend to share similar views concerning creation and the origin of the universe. <clears throat> that is, those who think cosmology shows us that there is a creator understand what it means to be a creator in essentially the same way as those who think that recent developments in cosmology eliminate the need for a creator. <clears throat> Historically, Big Bang cosmology, which affirms a singularity or starting point for our universe, a point beyond the categories of space and time and beyond the explanatory realm of physics, has been used to provide a kind of scientific confirmation for the traditional doctrine of creation. If there were a Big Bang, so this argument contends, then the universe began to be, and thus there must be a creator who caused the universe <coughs> to begin to be. Even Pope Pius XII once remarked that this cosmology offered support for the opening Genesis. Indeed, the traditional reading of Genesis, confirmed by the solemn pronouncement of the Fourth, Vatican Council, the Fourth Lateran Council in 1215, is that in the beginning means that the universe is temporally finite. The world and time begin to be as the result of God's creative word. Now, to speak of creation and the beginning of time 
as intimately connected, such that one necessarily entails the other, has often informed not only those who support creation, but also those who use new theories in cosmology to deny creation. If creation necessarily means that the universe has a beginning, then an eternal universe, one without a temporal beginning, could not be a created universe. Thus, those who embrace new cosmological theories, which propose an eternal series of Big Bangs, or a multiverse scenario according to which our universe is but one in an infinite number of universes. They call into question the intelligibility of an absolute temporal beginning. And hence, so it is thought, they call into question the intelligibility of creation itself. So I'm, I'm trying to suggest to you here is that the linking of creation with temporal beginning, that one necessarily implies the other, is a common denominator in the thought of those who use cosmology to affirm creation and those who use contemporary cosmology to deny creation. So, okay, but many cosmologists who now routinely speak of what happened before the Big Bang think that to reject some original Big Bang is to eliminate the need for a creator. They deny the need for a creator because they think to be created means to have a temporal beginning, which is fundamentally the same view of creation as that of those thinkers who use the idea of a primal Big Bang as evidence for a creator. In such a scenario, accepting or rejecting a creator is tied to accepting or to explaining away an original Big Bang. This, I think, is a fundamental error <coughs> which, each, uh, <coughs> which each side shares. <coughs> and I want to explore this error in a way with you this afternoon. <coughs> in the Grand Design, published in September of 2010, Stephen Hawking and his co-author Leonard Lottenow make the point that we cannot speak meaningfully of a beginning of the universe. <coughs> and then they add... Quotation six, spontaneous creation is the reason there is something rather than nothing, why the universe exists, why we exist. It is not necessary to invoke God to set the universe going. Citing a version of contemporary string theory known as M theory, they tell us that the creation of a great many universes out of nothing does not require the intervention of some supernatural being or God. Rather, these multiple universes, quote, arise naturally from physical law. Ultimate questions about the nature of existence, which have intrigued philosophers uh, for millennia, are, so they claim, now within the province of science, and of course that famous phrase, philosophy is dead. Theology, if mentioned at all, is simply dismissed as irrelevant. The principal argument <coughs> they offer is that once we recognize that our universe is but one of an infinite number, perhaps an almost infinite number of universes, then we do not need a special explanation, a grand designer, for the very precise initial conditions which account for life and our existence. And as I say, this is, <coughs> this is quotation seven on your handout. Just as Darwin explained how the apparent miraculous design of living forms could appear without intervention by a supreme being. The multiverse concept can explain the fine-tuning of physical law without the need for a benevolent creator who made the universe for our benefit. But the grand designer rejected by Hawking is not the creator, at least not the creator which traditional philosophy and theology affirms. The alleged conflict between creation and science, based on developments in both evolutionary biology and cosmology, which is often found in rejection of science in defense of a creator, and in rejection of a creator in defense of science, is the result of confusions about what creation is 
and what the explanatory extent of the natural sciences is. This is now quotation number eight <coughs> on your handout from me. <coughs> Creation as a metaphysical and theological notion affirms that all that is, in whatever way or ways it is, depends upon God as cause. The natural sciences have as their subject the world of changing things, from subatomic particles to acorns to galaxies. Whenever there is a change, there must be something that changes, whether these changes are biological or cosmological. Without beginning or end, or temporally finite, they remain processes. <coughs> Creation, on the other hand, is the radical causing of the whole existence of whatever exists. Creation is not a change. To cause completely something to exist is not to produce a change in something, is not to work on or with some existing material. When God's creative act is said <coughs> to be out of nothing, what is meant is that God does not use anything in creating all that is. It does not mean that there is a change from nothing to something. Quotation 9. Evolutionary biology, cosmology, and all the other natural sciences offer accounts of change. They do not address the metaphysical and theological questions of creation. They do not speak why there is something rather than nothing. <clears throat> it is a mistake to use arguments in the natural sciences to deny creation. This is precisely the mistake that Stephen Hawking and others make. <clears throat> Similarly, it is a mistake to appeal to cosmology as a confirmation of creation. Uh, creation is not a change. Cosmology studies change. In principle, cosmology can tell us nothing about whether the world is created or not. <clears throat> now, reason, as well as faith, can lead to knowledge of the creator. But the path is in metaphysics, not in the natural sciences. Now, to avoid confusion, we need to remember that to create here means something radically different from any kind of human making. Even though we do speak of human creations, especially with respect to the productions of works of art, music, and literature, <coughs> the human act of creating <coughs> is not the complete cause of what is produced. But God's creative act is the complete cause of what is produced. And this sense of being the complete cause is captured in the expression, out of nothing. God uses nothing other than God's power to create. <laughs> also, to say that God is the complete cause of all that is does not negate the role of other causes which are part of the created natural order. Creatures, both animate and inanimate, are real causes of the wide array of changes that occur in the world. But God alone is the universal cause of being as such. Without a proper understanding of the analogical notion of causality among creaturely causes and with respect to God, we cannot begin to grasp what it means for God to be a cause. God's causality is so different from the causality of creatures, that there is no competition between the two. That is, we do not need to limit, as it were, God's causality to make room for the causality of creatures. God causes creatures to be causes. He causes biological and cosmological processes to be what they are and to have their own causal integrity, which can be studied. <coughs> in biology, for example, in cosmology, and in all the natural sciences. Now, already in the 13th century, the groundwork was set 
for the fundamental understanding of creation and its relationship to the natural sciences. Working within the context of Aristotelian science, and aided by the insights of Muslim and Jewish thinkers, as well as his Christian predecessors, Thomas Aquinas provides an understanding of creation and science which remains true. Now, I think that when it comes to drawing philosophical and theological conclusions from contemporary science, insights from the Middle Ages remain valuable. You know, astronomers often note that to look out at the heavens is to look back in time. Perhaps to look back in time to medieval discussions of creation and science will help us to look out more clearly and to avoid confusions about both what we are seeing and what the implications of contemporary science are. The distinction between creation and change, and hence between the explanatory realm of the natural sciences on the one hand and creation on the other, this distinction between creation and change, to which I've already referred, is a key feature of Thomas Aquinas' analysis. As he wrote, and this is quotation 10 on your handout, over and above the mode of becoming by which something comes to be through change or motion, the realm of the natural sciences, over and above that realm, there must be a mode of becoming or origin of things without any mutation or motion through the influx of being. And here you see Thomas, influx of being, we're talking now in the realm of metaphysics, not in the realm of the natural sciences. Quotation 11, <clears throat> creation is not primarily some distant event. Rather, it is the ongoing, complete causing of the existence of all that is. At this very moment, were God not causing all that is to exist, there would be nothing at all. Creation concerns, <clears throat> first of all, the origin of the universe, not its temporal beginning. Indeed, it's important to recognize the difference between origin and beginning. The former origin affirms the complete, continuing dependence of all that is on God as cause. It may very well be that the universe had a temporal beginning, but there is no contradiction in the notion of an eternal, created universe. For were the universe to be without a beginning, it still would have an origin. It still would be created. This was precisely the position of Thomas Aquinas when he encounters Aristotelian science, and Aristotle thought the universe was eternal. Precisely the position of Aquinas, who accepted as a matter of faith that the universe had a temporal beginning but he also defended the intelligibility of a universe created and eternal. The distinction Thomas draws between creation understood philosophically in the discipline of metaphysics and creation understood theologically allows him to defend the intelligibility of an eternal created universe. The philosophical understanding of creation all that is depends upon God as cause for the very fact that it is. <coughs> the philosophical understanding of creation tells us nothing about the temporality of the universe. Indeed, Thomas also thought that neither science nor philosophy could know in principle whether the universe had a beginning. It's not a question susceptible to rational resolution not by the natural sciences, not by philosophy. He did think that metaphysics could show us for sure that the universe is created, but remember the philosophical sense of creation abstracts from, leaves aside the question of temporality. Thomas would have warned against those today who use Big Bang cosmology, for example, to conclude that the universe has a beginning and therefore must be created. Think of William Lane Craig, for example, who holds this view that we can know for sure through, big, through contemporary cosmology that the universe has a temporal beginning and therefore we can know it is created. 
a recent Jesuit cosmologist and philosopher, Robert Spitzer, has written a book, New Proofs for the Existence of God, in which Spitzer makes essentially the same argument that contemporary cosmology provides. New proofs for the existence of God. Well, they're not so new in a way. They're medieval Muslim arguments in part. Namely, that we know for sure through cosmology, through Big Bang cosmology, that the universe has an absolute temporal beginning. Therefore, we know for sure that it is created. That's the view of William Wayne Craig, Robert Spitzer, and some others. Thomas Aquinas would be horrified by these claims. He was always alert to reject the use of bad arguments in support of what is believed, because Thomas thought it was true that the universe has a temporal beginning, but that's only known in faith, not by reason. The singularity, and this is quotation 12, the singularity in traditional Big Bang cosmology may represent the beginning of the universe we observe, but we cannot conclude that it is the absolute beginning, the kind of beginning which would indicate creation. Experiments being performed at the Large Hadron Collider, that huge underground particle accelerator on the Swiss-French border, those experiments may bring us closer to what happened just after the Big Bang, but they will tell us nothing about creation. The distance between the minute fractions of a second after the Big Bang and creation is, in a sense, infinite. We do not get closer to creation by getting closer to the Big Bang. Furthermore, as some contemporary cosmologists recognize, there could very well be something before the Big Bang. Some cosmologists have used insights from quantum mechanics to offer accounts of the Big Bang itself. They speak of the Big Bang as in terms of quantum tunneling from nothing, analogous to the way in which very small particles seem to emerge spontaneously from vacuums in laboratory experiments. Thus they think that to explain the Big Bang in this way, quantum tunneling from nothing, a kind of fluctuation of a primal vacuum, to explain the Big Bang in this way eliminates the need for a creator. But the Big Bang explained in this way is still a change. And as we have seen, creation properly understood is not a change at all. Similarly, the nothing in these cosmological models which speak of quantum tunneling from nothing is not the nothing referred to in the traditional sense of creation out of nothing. This is true even in the case of recent theories which speak of space, time, and the laws of physics themselves emerging from nothing. The nothing in cosmological reflections may very well be nothing like our present universe, but it is not the absolute nothing central to what it means to create. It is only that about which the theories say nothing. The crucial point here is that to offer a scientific <coughs> account of the Big Bang is not to say anything about whether or not the universe is created. <coughs> now, Lawrence Krauss, whom I mentioned at the beginning of my talk, simply rejects any appeal to notions of nothing which are beyond the explanatory domain of the natural sciences. As he said in an interview on National Public Radio in the United States last month, in quotation 13, the question of why there is something rather than nothing is really a scientific question, not a religious or philosophical question, because both nothing and something are scientific concepts, and our discoveries over the past 30 years have completely changed what we mean by nothing. Now, it's surely the case that contemporary physics offers various accounts of how something comes from the nothing which contemporary physics embraces. But it remains the case that the fundamental question of why there is something rather than nothing is a metaphysical and theological question. And with respect to such a question, the natural sciences necessarily have nothing to say. Simply stipulating that it is only the natural sciences that properly speak to the origin of the universe as Krauss does, 
is a kind of summary dismissal of metaphysics and theology as legitimate areas of discourse. Remember the passage from Krauss, which I quoted earlier, without science, any definition is just words. One wonders what scientific evidence supports such a claim. The desire to separate the natural sciences from the alleged contamination of the word <coughs> games of philosophy and theology, that is not new. Now, as always, however, it reveals an impoverished philosophical <coughs> judgment. <coughs> Quotation 14. Those contemporary cosmological theories which employ a multiverse hypothesis or an infinite series of big bangs do not challenge the fundamental feature of what it means to be created. That is the complete dependence of all that is on God as cause. An eternal universe would be no less dependent upon God than the universe which has a beginning in time. To be created out of nothing does not mean that a created universe must be temporally finite. For one who believes that the universe has a temporal beginning, any theory of an eternal world would have to be rejected. But a believer should be able to distinguish between the question of the kind of universe God creates, one with a temporal beginning or one without, should be able to distinguish between the kind of universe God creates and the fact that whatever kind of universe there is, God is the creator. It was the genius of Thomas Aquinas to distinguish between creation understood philosophically with no reference to temporality and creation understood theologically, which included the recognition that the universe does have an absolute temporal beginning. Thomas's analysis of creation and its relationship to what the natural sciences and philosophy tell us is a good example of the importance of science and philosophy for theological reflection, indeed of the appropriate autonomy of these disciplines in any theological view of the world. Now, evolutionary biology does not concern the ultimate origin of the universe. It only concerns creation when creation is construed as referring to divine agency in an already existing world, with God's intervening, so to speak, to produce new spirit species. The error here is to think that there is an incompatibility between an evolutionary account of change based on causes in nature and God's creative action, that it must somehow be one or the other. But natural selection is not an alternative to divine agency. Chance mutations at the genetic level do not call into question God as creator. God causes things both to be the kinds of things which they are and to exercise the kind of causality which is properly their own. Even the reality of chance and contingency depends upon God as cause. God causes chance events to be chance events. But God transcends the created order in such a radical way that he is able to be active in the world without being a competing cause in the world. God does not cause things to be in the same way that causes in nature function. Causes in nature differ from one another. I am a cause different from the way in which a molecule is a cause. God differs differently. God is not just some other cause. He's not a superpower. One does not have to choose between evolutionary biology and creation to affirm one need not be a denial of the other, we can have both Darwin and God. The interconnected world of changing things, a kind of horizontal realm, ought not to be confused with the vertical dimension of creation, a vertical dimension upon which the horizontal continues to depend for its very existence. Order, design, chance, and contingency all concern the horizontal realm. The very reality of all things depends upon the vertical dimension. 
we ought not to think that to create in its primary sense means to produce order. To explain order and design in terms of processes within nature does not eliminate the need for a creator. A creator who is responsible for the existence of nature and everything in it. Quotation 15. Throughout my comments this afternoon, I've emphasized what it means to be created from a philosophical point of view that is based on reason alone. What scripture tells a believer about what it means to be created includes all that philosophy discloses and adds much more. Not only that the created universe has a temporal beginning, but that creation is an act of divine love and that the opening phrase of Genesis, in the beginning, also means in and through the second person of the Trinity, and much more to, to, to the theological conception. My purpose here, however, in discussing the relation between the doctrine of creation and contemporary science, is to emphasize a common starting point for any such discussion. And that common starting point is human reason, not an appeal to revelation. God's creative power is exercised throughout the entire course of cosmic history in whatever way that his way or ways that history has unfolded. God creates a universe in which things have their own causal agency, their own true self-sufficiency, a nature which is susceptible to scientific analysis. No explanation of cosmological or biological change, no matter how radically random or contingent such an explanation claims to be, no explanation in biology or cosmology challenges the metaphysical account of creation that is of the dependence of the existence of all things upon God as cause. When some thinkers deny creation on the basis of theories in the natural sciences, or reject the conclusions of these sciences in defense of creation, they misunderstand creation or the natural sciences or both. Philosophical reflection, especially in the tradition of Thomas Aquinas, allows us to avoid much of the confusion in contemporary discussions about creation and science. Curiosity, the title of that television series that began last August on the Discovery Channel in the United States. Curiosity is a noble human trait, but curiosity, undisciplined by philosophical rigor, leads absolutely nowhere. Those who are only curious remain like the fallen angels in Milton's Paradise Lost, in wandering mazes lost. Thank you very much. <laughs> Thank you. Uh, thank you very much indeed, Bill. I'm sure that stimulated uh, plenty of questions. So, uh, and there's one at the back. Please, sir. Thank you. Yes. Why do you say in here that science is actually neutral and it can never be used in any uh, theological apologetic? No. Then uh, we'll hear the question. It's a good question. Am I saying that the natural sciences are, are theologically neutral? Well, in one sense, they are theologically neutral because they're the natural sciences. But theology, philosophy and, the, philo philosophy and theology can use the insights of the natural sciences, indeed, to make arguments about the existence of God, but not of God as creator. That's an argument in metaphysics. So I would think that it, it would be possible, as Aristotle thought, thought, he could argue from the existence of motion to the reality of an unmoved mover. That would be an argument starting in the natural sciences, in what Aristotle would call physics, leading to the conclusion that given the fact of motion, there must be an unmoved mover. And Thomas Aquinas agrees with that argument. That's the first of his famous five ways. Furthermore, Thomas thinks that from the uh, teleology in nature, from the directedness of natural processes, especially the natural processes of unthinking things, uh, but more natural processes, from the natural processes in nature, one can see 
the need for a source of that intelligible directiveness in nature. This is Thomas's fifth argument for the existence of God. But to argue for the necessity of a source of intelligibility and directiveness in nature is not yet to argue for a creator. So my point would be that an argument about creation as distinct now from some other argument for the existence of an unmoved mover, for the existence of a source of water, and so forth. Exist argument about creation is an argument properly in the metaphys in metaphysics and not in the natural sciences at all. Now, clearly, metaphysics, which talks about how to explain the existence of things, presupposes that things exist they're intelligible, and so forth. But the argument in metaphysics for the existence of God as cause of, for God as cause of existence is not an argument itself based in the natural sciences. The way in which an argument from motion to an unmoved mover, from order and design to a source of uh, order and design. So I would be critical of someone who said that the natural sciences can give complete accounts of order and design in nature without ultimately appealing to some source of that order and design. I only want to distinguish that type of argument from an argument for creation itself. Uh, I'm writing a book which is called After Darwin and Hawking, Thomas Aquinas. Because <laughs> it was crucial. What I want to say is that Hawking, Darwin, and Hawking have performed a very important, have given a very important contribution to thinking about creation. Because many people think that creation means God's producing order and design. And Darwin, well, evolutionary biology, I use Darwin just as a name, evolutionary biology offers accounts of natural processes producing order and design in nature. That helps eliminate a naive notion of what creation is. Similarly, the emphasis in contemporary cosmology about a beginning or not a beginning, and that somehow by denying a beginning we deny creation, that helps get rid of another naive notion of creation. So in a way, the contribution of the arguments against the creator, based on evolutionary biology and based on cosmology, serve a useful purpose of clearing away naive notions of what creation is, and perhaps allowing us to think again, in the vision of Thomas Aquinas, about what creation properly means, both philosophically and theologically. Okay. Peace. Um, you say that... Uh Whatever kind of universe there is, or whatever kind of universe we may discern in the future, as science goes forward, um, God created it. So that creation uh, doesn't tell us anything about the universe per se. So if we take your view of creation, which is just that, whatever is and whatever we understand is what creation God created, what do we learn? Well, we, uh, I would want that quick. We know that uh, philosophical claims and theological claims about the existence or non-existence of a creator based on, con based on developments in science in the past, present, and future, that those claims which challenge the intelligibility of belief in a creator are false, first thing. The second thing is we know that whatever is, is caused by God. That's no small thing to know, would it not? Right? Uh, well, it doesn't tell us anything about what we know. Or what sure, we know. It, well, uh, sure, it tells us that everything which is, in whatever way it is, depends upon God as cause. Metaphysics isn't physics. It isn't biology. It, tells us, it gives us truths in the discipline of metaphysics what it means for things to be, what it means for things to depend upon God as cause. I think an 11th century Muslim theologian who taught al-Ghazali, this guy's name is al juwani said the first obligation of any intelligent Muslim is to come, is to reason as effectively as that person can to the fact that the world is created. 
Why? Because it recognizes the, the sovereignty of God. It calls upon proper worship of God and so forth. It would seem to me of considerable theological, <coughs> ethical, personal relevance to recognize that everything which is, including our very thoughts, including the coolness of the night air, everything which is in whatever ways th those things are, depend upon God as cause. Wouldn't that at least evoke some worshipful reflection? I mean, wouldn't there be a theological, religious implication of that metaphysical knowledge? See, metaphysics gives us knowledge of reality. And it would seem to me that knowledge of reality perfects us as human beings, as human knowers. Now, it's a mistake to confuse metaphysical knowledge with the knowledge of which, of which chemistry provides. But in, in the ensemble of human knowing, metaphysics has an important role to play, and a very significant role to play. Yes. Yeah, yeah. Um, I'm trying to understand your ideas about causation and creation. Right. So can I ask you this? Are you saying that if the universe exists at one instant of time, it does not have a given, inbuilt predisposition to continue to exist? That's a good question. Muslim theologians, eventually called occasionalists, thought yes. They thought God, from instant to instant, from atom to atom, God had to create them. For Thomas, creation is, as I said, not a distant event. God is causing things to exist right now. How does, how do things which are created exist is another metaphysical question. Thomas thought, contrary to his great colleague at the University of Paris, Bonaventure, Thomas thought that God gives being in such a way that entities, in a way, possess their own existence and therefore are capable of being real causes in nature. God's creative act is so powerful that he causes things to be their own things, as it were. Now, it's not an absolute ownness, but it still is a robust notion of the integrity of nature and hence a robust defense of the possibility of the sciences of nature discovering real causes. So Thomas doesn't think that, that God creates and that by some separate act, God must sustain creation. That's Bonaventure's view. Bonaventure thinks that create, because creation is out of nothing, things naturally tend towards nothing, and therefore God has to be involved by some separate act sustaining their existence. Thomas, th Thomas thinks that the creative act is such that those things which are created do not on their own tend towards nothingness. They possess a reality truly their own. And this is important because it allows Thomas to affirm a tremendous notion of God's so sovereignty and omnipotence and a real autonomy to nature. The debate in which he participated in the Middle Ages, which is a debate today with process theologians, the debate in which he participated was such that people thought in order to defend the integrity and autonomy of nature, you had to reduce divine omnipotence a little bit. You had to make room for creatures to be their own cause. Or the more you affirmed divine sovereignty, the less power you gave to the, created, to the created order. So people debated about this. This is why process theology, from Whitehead on, denies the doctrine of creation out of nothing. Because they think the doctrine of creation out of nothing gives too much power to God and not enough integrity to nature. Okay, Thomas, I, I, I misunderstood you. I thought you were upholding what you now say as a Bonaventure point of view. No, no, not. no. God right Now, it's... But, but we, got, we also have to remember that creation isn't an event that happens. Creation is, as it were, right now. God's, God didn't do something in the past and then he continues doing it. I mean, he, he, because God doesn't exist in time in that sense. 
Okay. Uh, lots of hands going up. Yes, please, sir. Yes. Uh, I think on your definition of creation, which is very helpful, uh, but surely there is there is it's possible to have a, a perhaps what could be a bigger view of creation than that to say yes, we're going to have Aquinas' view of creation, but nevertheless to still come in and say the laws of nature alone leave certain gaps where perhaps a more explicitly creative act is necessary. So if you take something like, for example, the feeding of the 5,000, the laws of nature alone are not sufficient. The miracle, by definition, pulls in some sort of supernatural creative act of some sort. And uh, for some people, that can help them towards faith, surely. Oh, well, Thomas Aquinas certainly thinks there are miracles, yeah. and he certainly thinks that would be that would be one miracle. Huh? Yeah. But but Thomas would also want to argue that the the fact of miracles doesn't challenge the integrity and autonomy of natural processes. Thomas, first of all, like Aristotle, isn't a determinist. He thinks there are chance events in the natural order. So he would certainly agree that that there are miracles, and that those miracles uh, are an example of a direct action of God outside of nat supra natura, outside of the natural outside of the natural processes. And he would agree with you too that this would be of aid for people uh, who uh, for people who are, who are to be believers. So miracles, Thomas would affirm, also exist. Huh? Thomas would also say that each human soul is immediately created by God, immediately, without mediation, is immediately created by God. I mean, that would be another example of where he thought that there was, a, 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 in some sense, an action which could only be performed by God. Natural processes themselves cannot produce it. My point was that natural processes are able to, are able to explain all those things which, in principle, natural processes can explain whether or not the existence of the human soul and its coming into existence is something which natural processes can explain is a question in the natural sciences, it's a question in the philosophy of nature, and it's also a question in metaphysics, because it concerns, well, what is the soul? By understanding what the soul is, then one gets a better sense of whether that's within the explanatory domains of biology or natural sciences or not. But he would say that's also a philosophical question, what the soul is doing. Okay, I think there was a question here, yes. yes. No, I think that would be the last question, I'm afraid, sorry. A small question about nothing. Um, <laughs> it's perhaps unfair to ask you this, as it's really the views of those you are arguing against, but for people like Krauss and other such uh, writers, um, how do they go about in terms which give it all sorts of properties, <laughs> contingent properties, not logically necessary properties, <clears throat> which enable them to explain how you might get a world by the Well, I think that there, is, despite the fact that many contemporary scientists say, well, they're not interested in philosophy, that they are philosophically neutral, and so forth and so on, this is an example of the fact that they're not philosophically neutral at all. They embrace a kind of naive positivism, that the only kind of explanation for anything is what the natural sciences offer. So we can speak about nothing in the natural sciences, and the nothing we speak of in terms of a vacuum or in terms of space, uh, that's really a, a, a possible scientific subject. But Krauss goes even farther, and Peter Atkins at Oxford goes even farther and says, that the very law through notions of quantum gravity and quantum mechanics, the very laws of nature can come out of a profound nothing, a nothing with a capital N, which is unlike the vacuums, unlike empty space, and so forth. My point is there is just a huge philosophical confusion here, and it's a philosophical <coughs> confusion in part born by a kind of scientism which tells us that the only explanation of reality that is acceptable is something which the empirical sciences offer, and a kind of uh, smug dismissal of uh, philosophical and theological reflections as being nothing but word games. Uh, yeah, I mean, the problem is that 
problem I have is simply that it, it, it seems you, you don't, it's not even that you need to deny, uh, that you, you need to assert the possibility of non-scientific yeah. explanations, it's simply that you're not getting down to a unique explanation. Yeah. You're saying, here are um, a set of laws, say, uh, which get you from nothing to something more recognisable, yeah. and um, yet, yet it, it isn't nothing in any very useful sense. Yeah, well, but they think of nothing in terms of not anything that we are talking about <laughs> in our theory. <laughs> and of course, that, that is a, that's, that's a, a true sense of nothing. I've introduced by people at, at other places uh, 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 sometimes as being a person who goes around the world making distinctions about nothing. <laughs> but that's, you see, that's absolutely essential, making, making these distinctions. Let me just end by telling you what the counter-argument to my whole position would be. There is no such thing as metaphysics. Existence is a brute fact. It doesn't need an explanation. Huh? So that, I mean, that would be the more sophisticated or the beginnings of a more sophisticated refutation for my position, that my whole argument presupposes that why there is something rather than nothing is a legitimate question. Yeah, in my argument was more that they that, haven't gone. That's right, that's right. And I could handle that argument, but but it would have to be done dialectically. But that would be, so I wish to fit, that would be the beginning of a counter-argument. I think... Bill, are you able to stay around a few minutes? Yeah, yeah, sure, sure. Have, yeah, I think Bill can stay for a little while if you wanted to carry on the discussion. I'm afraid we as a group will have to finish, but also finish by thanking Bill very much indeed for a fascinating talk. <laughs>